Wonderful. So thank you so much for coming. We are so proud and happy that Saif has been able to come this long way to speak to us today. Um, and we are also proud to say that this is part of the pre-events that we have been building for the UIA Congress um, that we will be hosting as, a, uh, as part of our activities here at the Academy in the summer of 2023. So what we are looking at in the, in the World Congress um, is, which is called the Sustainable Futures, Leave No One Behind, is to understand how architecture can contribute to the SDGs. So how are we part of both the problem space and the solution space of how to achieve the SDGs. Um, in this work uh, around trying to find out what the dialogues um, have been, we have been doing a series of events and in a very wonderful way, I was uh, able to meet Saif in Brazil on Zoom, <laughs> slightly on, in Brazil, uh, where we spoke together uh, in a Congress. And I think we were mutually very inspired by each other. I think that your voice is such an important part of what we're trying to establish with the World Congress, both from uh, uh, um, the idea of how we are, as a planet are using our resources, but also as how we are then also achieving social e equity um, and engaging with um, the people that are living and building our built environment. So we're very, very pleased that you're here. And um, without much ado, I will give the word to you. Thank you. so much, Mette. It's okay, yeah. Well, wonderful to be here at the Academy and in Copenhagen. The first time for me coming to Denmark. So uh, it's been an exciting uh, thing to look forward to that uh, I'll be coming to Denmark. It's an honor. And because when someone asks you to come and share your work, it means that what you are doing, people are finding it interesting. And if that is the thing, that is the greatest joy an architect or a person can have that they're people who are interested to know why one is doing it in this way. I mean, we want to have big projects. We want to have a lot of uh, attention. But inside, in your deep inside you, there is a feeling, there's a fulfillment that, okay, what you have done has um, communicated something important. So I think this is a great honor to come to Copenhagen, to this prestigious institution. And I'm hoping that this presentation can communicate something because I can look at the audience who are far from where I work. So it is, it is also a challenge for me to communicate what has brought me here. So thank you. And when we are meeting at a time when we are recovering from one crisis, the crisis of the pandemic, when we, we didn't know three years back, I mean, 2019, in the winter of 2019, we started getting this news that something is happening out there in China, far from where we are. Even Bangladesh was far, though it's closer to China, but we didn't know that in a few months time, we will uh, be totally shut, closed, locked, and a fear factor working among us. What next? What next? So th that, that is how, I mean, 
most of the places on this earth were affected by that. And that crisis was met rapidly. One was the group of scientists who were doing research that how to face this. And what the other was this human ingenuity of organizing the defenses. How do we keep people safe? So I, I think that that proves that we are able to face difficulties, face disruptions, if we are working together and we can uh, create uh, a safe and a better place uh, for us. But sadly, with uh, the pandemic being brought under control, we face another crisis, the war. So it's, it's like that we are constantly facing a challenge or the other. And I don't know, because people were talking about this war and all these things that it might happen, the possibilities are there, but we didn't know that when it's going to happen, it's going to happen like this. And it happened. And all of a sudden, again, the disruptions and these disruptions are not that different from the disruptions of pandemic. At least we are being able to travel. This is the first time after the pandemic, I mean, when the pan I'm traveling outside. I mean, I have not set my foot outside Bangladesh from 2019 winter. I mean, up to the winter I have been. So this is great that uh, Natalia and Mete had thought that this is time Saif can come and visit us and share his experiences. So this is uh, something we need to uh, look into that we may have disruptions, we may have uh, this kind of problems, but we don't uh, give up. We keep on trying how to uh, fight these things. Catastrophes, economic problems, war. And then there are other problems that we are facing, which has been in the making for quite some time. And just now we were having this conversation at Meta's office with Natalie and Phil. We're talking about the climate crisis, the climate issues. I mean, the warnings were being sounded, I think since 1992, when the Rio summit had taken place that something is happening. There is a change happening. And today, we are at in 2022, so 30 years we have been, I mean, and all this research, all these studies, and the warning that no, it's, it's we, we better do something. We have to get into uh, more, I mean, action than just talking. And so what, what actions we need to do? Scientists have found amazing amount of data information, which are facts, which is not fiction. And it is up to us, whether you are an architect, whether you are a doctor, whether you are an engineer, we, we need to put uh, things in that direction. So this is the climate change. And the other we were talking, which is not environmental, which is social, and that is uh, inequality. This, and the reason I give towards an architecture of equity, because this term meant a lot to me. It's not equality, but I'm talking about equity here using the term that how we can share our lives in a way that we are not so much away from each other. We have a share which is not disproportionate. I'm not saying that we give up things or we take everything, but we consume, we produce in a way that 
reduces the differences existing. So climate crisis, inequality, to me, are one of the most important uh, issues that we are facing today. And the reason I put that, because in 2020, yeah, 2020, I was invited by uh, Domus to write an uh, essay with the uh, question, what next? So they invited many architects. So I was one of the architects. So uh, it, it sent me thinking in the COVID days, because that's a very appropriate term to be uh, for the uh, section being edited by David Chipperfield, uh, uh, the architect from UK. What next? And to me, I thought that, well, this is next. Why not an architecture of equity where we are going to share a common future? I'm thankful to Royal Danish Academy, the International Union of Architects, and in particular to Natalie Mossin, to Mete Ramsgaard, Thompson. And I'm also thankful to Pernille, Pernille Maria Bernheim. She has been meticulously looking after this visit of mine, because when I was approached, that was uh, early uh, this year. And then she kept on communicating, finalizing the dates, and then how I would travel, how I would get the visa, all this. I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed and happy that there was one person who was keeping track that I mean, I, I could always get back to her. So special thanks to her also. And thanks to all of you who have taken your time to come and listen to what I'm going to share experience. So I will go to the next slide. I'll take it a little bit easy. I don't know how much time I'll be a little slow and rapid, but so. so my coming to Copenhagen from Bangladesh to Denmark. So I flew like this to Dubai and then I flew and I could see Kiev in the Kiev or Kiev, how, how do you pronounce that? The Ukrainian capital when I did it. And you could see that as a spot that was being in the map there were other places, but Kiev was very prominent. So we were avoiding, the flight was coming like this, Turkey and, this, and then there was, this is, I think, Ukraine. And then we could see that. So we were coming, I was coming here to share about architecture, but I was passing through that place where a war is being waged. And when I come here, when I'm received in the airport by these two young, lovely ladies, I could feel the warmth that was waiting for me here. I arrived at a temperature which was quite cold for me, but these people who were welcoming me and who have been with me till now had made me feel that there's no need to feel cold. And this morning, when I came out of the hotel, when I saw this lovely morning, the sunshine and all these people going to work by bike, parents taking their children, and I was so impressed that such a beautiful way to start the day. So this is uh, something, and then, this is about the coming, flying, but I didn't fly exactly like that, as I mentioned. And then where I've come from, I've come from here, Bangladesh. So this is South Asia, you all know, and this is Southeast Asia that we all know. So if you can see that Bangladesh is positioned in a place where 
the West and the East comes and meets because these are the hills. Phil was mentioning about Meghalaya. So this is Meghalaya, this borders uh, Bangladesh, and this is where the hills are. So when people came to India by land or by sea, so this was a natural barrier for crossing into the East. So Bangladesh is positioned into that uh, uh, situation. And also culturally, we are different from here and other places because we eat a lot of rice. We grow rice, we, we, our country is more at times mostly water, which we will show. And these are dry areas, but climate change has made these areas also watery because you have heard about the floods in Pakistan a couple of, I mean, just a month back or so. So and it's amazing that a place where people never thought floods like that can happen. And that is real, that's happening. And all this water, all of a sudden because people were not prepared. So that is Bangladesh. And this year we celebrate 50 years of our independence. So we became independent in 1971. So we are a fairly young country. I mean, in the contemporary sense, but we are not that young. We are uh, at least 3000 years, if not more, because 3000 years we say, because we can find evidence of inhabitation, people living there. There are some structures, some ruins, that tells us that people have been living here for a few thousand years. And our history is intertwined with whole of India. So South Asia or India, they are uh, intertwined. And, and then Bangladesh, it's a country of rivers. I mean, the way we have veins and arteries in our body. So the country has this, all this rivers system flowing from the Himalayas into the Bay of Bengal. So the landscape is flat mostly with all these rivers crisscrossing the landscape. And if you take a closer look, this is how the network, whether it's the rain or the waters coming from the Himalayas, they weave this kind of a network. We call it Bengal veins, like human body. So uh, we have this veins. And this is what I see this morning coming in uh, Copenhagen. So, a man who has come from the country of rivers has come to Denmark, Copenhagen. And as I was telling that it's a lovely experience when you come to a new place, you have new experience, you meet new people and you experience things because you expect that a modern country, a lot of motor vehicles in the road and in my country, people would dream of owning a car. And when I come here, I see that it's everybody's on bicycle, most of the people. And I find it amazing. This is the way to the future. So the future, what maybe we are looking at out there is probably not the future one would, because you have been there. You all have been having cars and everything, but you decide to do this. But my familiarity with Denmark from my childhood days goes from the fairy tale and the milk powder. I'm talking about when I was growing up as a child in the early 70s and then later on uh, becoming a young man. So this fairy tale stories, whether it was a translation in Bangla or the original, would weave up an ima uh, image. So I was talking about 
uh, to my friends here, young friends, uh, about them, and they were asking me which one. Then I said it's the ugly duckling. That one I like. Why you like ugly duckling? I said it's the transformation, something that was considered not beautiful, and all of a sudden that becomes a beautiful thing. And the milk powder, because in the 70s or in the 60s, you know that we have a big population and to support the population, you need uh, food and milk is essential for uh, children. And then there was not enough to produce at home. So it started getting imported because in a dry form, in powders, in, in these containers. And I remember the shops with all this milk uh, tin, uh, which were coming from Netherlands, from Switzerland, from Denmark, from Australia. So Deno was from Denmark. And I, I remember this so well. So, and then, uh, I was asking that, what else is uh, Denmark? And they mentioned Lego. Yes, I was familiar with Lego in my childhood because one of my class friends had a Lego set who had, uh, whose father was uh, in Europe and took that. So Legos were not that common. So Denmark is something that uh, is n uh, absolutely nothing new. So from your childhood, and then after independence of Bangladesh, we had a lot of cooperation from Denmark to rebuild a country which was devastated by war. And Danida is the uh, organization who helped in many important sectors, but one important sectors that is river ferries because we didn't have that many roads, that many bridges, so we needed to cross the rivers and the Danish government assisted in building of these ferries that would help us to cross these mighty rivers. These rivers, I mean, one has to see at times during the monsoon, if you're standing on one side, you wouldn't be able to see the other side. So recently we have built a big bridge across the Ganges or the Padda we had uh, seen. So Denmark is one of those countries which came forward to help Bangladesh to get on its feet after the war. And that was the, I mean, the war was not for long, for nine months, but the devastations were a lot in, in many terms, in material and also social uh, terms. So what I'm going to share today is, a, is, a, is, is my work experience. So we, we just go uh, and see the experiences. And this is, again, back to Bangladesh. I'm one architect who hasn't built much. I've built very little, and then again, I had a period where I was intensely working and then came a period where it slowed down. And again, you find yourself, you discover yourself to be active again. So uh, in this small country with a big population, so this is the places where works have been built, and these are the places like I could not build, but there are many unbuilt work. I mean, I have a big, huge list of unbuilt uh, projects. And then, how am I going to talk about my work? I'm using a language which is not exactly my native language. I'm speaking in English, and Phil, no offense to you, but I tell you that this language came to us in a little difficult way, because when you have uh, people coming and taking over your country and they don't want to leave for 200 years, so you have to learn 
the language, to go along, and then one day you are uh, free, you are independent. But in that period of time, you lose a lot of things. And one is the language that we are uh, communicating. So my native language, my mother tongue is Bangla. So if I was speaking to you in Bangla, I wouldn't make any sense to you unless there was someone translating. So that wouldn't make it, I, I don't know, interesting. So this language, Bangla has, again, a very long history of evolving. So we call it Indo-European, the origin, because we know that how languages, how people have traveled. And so from 3,500 years, the language has been evolving. And this is the script. So how the scripts have evolved. So this is contemporary Bangla. Maybe at the end, I will speak a Bangla word. So uh, you can uh, listen uh, about that. And talking about architecture, I have to. This is the school where I went to study architecture. The school was established in 1962. So 60 years, you have that book, uh, which celebrated 50 years. So it's been only 60 years that there has been a school of architecture in Bangladesh. And it was the only school when I started studying architecture and it was only one school that was there till 1992. So imagine a country which is 3000 years old, there was no place to study architecture, sadly so. It was like that because architecture probably was not considered to be uh, important subject that needed to be taught prior to the partition of India. So that is how history has been like. And this school was started with the help of the Americans. It was like a technical assistance. Okay, we need an architecture school. And the school was tied with the engineering school. So we are mostly architects here. So when engineers are in majority, we have uh, at least there, we had an issue that engineering has not been very sympathetic to architecture. So architecture needs to be more closer to the humanities. I mean, science is there. Today at Phil's laboratory, I was feeling more like meeting a scientist than an architect because all these equipments and machineries. So we have to combine science and the humanities and the arts. So we have a very unique discipline and architecture needs to be taught in that manner. But here we find that we are learning architecture from the Americans. And then we find that this is architecture, a, a, a nation with all this history, all of a sudden is starting from new. But no, no worries. But this is an architect from South Asia. It's a drawing from sixth century AD. So you can see this man with a set square, with a big scale, and look at the attire. And these were the people who had this knowledge of how to design and build precisely this uh, huge complexes. That is, uh, you have been to India traveling and you know that how uh, detailed and how organized this architecture that you find over there. But because of this gap of this missing links, so this is a stopoti because uh, that's the Sanskrit word for an architect or Bangla. So this is a stopoti from sixth century. And this is the palm leaf manuscript of the architect. 
So that's the portrait of the architect, all the calculations here, and the proportions, the plan. So this is the architectural drawing from sixth century, but this drawing is based on a knowledge that was passed on orally from one generation to the other before it was written down as a book or a treatise, whatever you say, or drawn out. So being sort of linked to this past, so only 60 years we went to study architecture. But architecture was an ancient art, a science. And look at this plumb bob. It was from the Gupta period, found in a river. And the intricate detail the architect used to keep the walls plumb. So if this instrument is so well detailed and cast metal, bronze, so you can imagine the, the creative abilities. But history has been such. OK. And then this is something that is there in Bangladesh within this 147,000 kilo, square kilometers of land. We have history of architecture from third century BC to eighth century AD to 12th, 13th century and to the recent 20th, early 20th century. So, so it, it has been changing, evolving, and what people considered to be important, that was reflected in the built form, in the architecture of a small country, but a big uh, population. And then in the early 50s, one man who studied engineering before the partition of India in 1947, decides to go and study architecture. His name is Mazhul Islam. So in 1950, he went to study architecture in Oregon, in USA. He had a scholarship. And then after coming back, he designed these two important buildings. One is the art college, and the other is the public library. Very important institutions for a country that has become independent, partition, but he introduces modern architecture, the modernity that has evolved here in Europe, and then it has gone to United States and then spread all over the world. So this man in 1953 was 30 years old. So imagine a 30 year young man producing this works. You can see the influence of, of course, Le Corbusier, Alvar Aalto, but he designs some things which incorporates the local uh, climate, material, and he creates a new modernity. So again, this masonates, a laboratory, and in the 60s, he again goes in the early 60s to study architecture with Paul Rudolph in Yale because he wanted to know more. So in the 60s, he goes to study at Yale to do a master's degree. And he comes back more energized, more inspired because modernism at that time in the campuses of Yale or Harvard or MIT were, were very flourishing, very active. So he comes back, his ideas taking, sorry. Okay, I'm going back. And gradually he started evolving a particular 
type of doing architecture which was responding to the climate, to material, and to a society where the inequality was going to be addressed through architecture. For example, this is a housing project. I mean, it might look a uh, little, what do you call that, formal. And, but he devised, I'll show you the design of the campus for this, this is the university. So how do you bring in different groups of people who may not be uh, of same uh, income group, but at least share spaces where you can, cannot differentiate from outside who is rich, who is poor. So you, you live. This, this, is, this is a housing for a mining township and they were going to be senior officers, they're going to be junior officers, they're going to be workers and everybody, but your houses, someone may have two rooms, someone may have four rooms, but you live in an environment which tells that we are from the same place, same. So he uses a form. And then the studies that he did to evolve that form with his friend, Stanley Tigerman from US. So they were very good. They become buddies in Yale and then they worked together. They designed projects together in Bangladesh and they studied the development of a architectural, I mean, uh, a generation of formal ideas for architecture, taking the idea of climate that what would work best for Bangladesh's climate? What sort of buildings you want to do? So then this diagonal shape things, wind, the sun. So th uh, this is how he studied. And this is a master plan he drew for a campus in near Dhaka, a university campus based on those ideas that he developed with his friend. And of course, you know about Louis Kahn. When he went to Yale, he came to know about Kahn because he studied in Louis Kahn's uh, Yale Art Gallery. That's where his classes would be taking. So when the Pakistan government wanted to have a new parliament, new capital, they wanted to bring architect from outside and they went to Mazar Islam asking for suggestions. Corbusier, Alvar Aalto, and Louis Kahn. So in that order, the government was informed. Corbusier said that he cannot take another subcontinental assignment. He was busy with Chandigarh. Alvar Aalto took the job. He was traveling to Bangladesh or East Pakistan at that time, but he became unwell on the way and he had to be in Switzerland to recover. And Khan was sent a telegram that whether he was interested and Khan readily accepted. 1962, he gets this telegram to come and design the parliament for Pakistan. And now it's Bangladesh. So this is up to 1971. 71, is this line that brings uh, a change to our country, our history. Because in 71, we had to fight a war to become independent. So on 16 December, this is the time, a cover of this American magazine Time, December 20, 1971. So on 16 December, 1971, we could finish the war with the help of the Indian army, of course, and we became an independent country. So from 72 to 2022, what we have been doing is something 
which as free people and we love our freedom and even as architects we love this so the works that i'll be sharing expresses that thing that yes there are restrictions there are things that which ties us uh within a boundary but we need to think of going beyond that boundary so when i was studying architecture and before graduating as i mentioned it was the only school and mazhar e islam unfortunately was not being part of that school and some of us decided to go to him and learn about architecture so this is a this is mazhar e islam this is me i mean i have finished my studies this is my colleague who's heading the bengal institute and this is professors and students so we were talking about this city so this was the early 80s just out of the school we started a new school keeping mazhar e islam in the middle with all of us gathering and we took out a manifesto we took out a declaration that these are the things that we need to do so you can see that we are linking the parliament with this buddhist monastery i mean trying to tie our history and it's not that we are trying to say that that is the thing we want to go back we want to be linking the past and the present and then go beyond the present listing out so a, a, a manifesto probably or declarations is something from the 20s and 30s or even up to the 50s here in europe but there in the early 80s some architects together gets together and has listed all these things that they need to do and one was that we need to dig up also in our past so i now go into my work so in 1984 i graduated in 83 in 1984 i had a chance to participate in a design competition an open architectural design competition and i was working in a partnership at that time the competition the project was for a memorial a monument to commemorate the event when this government of bangladesh in exile formed and in a place within bangladesh because it was under the occupation of pakistan army so near the indian border there was a place where the government could convene the swearing in ceremony so how do you do a monument for an event like that government wanted to do a monument so i will so this is the event in april 1971 the president in exile declaring that we form the government of bangladesh within a mango grove plenty of mango trees in a small clearing and the country was under occupation by the pakistan army and there were journalists from all over the world they wanted to record this moment a historic moment a new country which is occupied by a army and then they have decided to form a government and not outside not i mean the government was in exile but they were in the soil of bangladesh declaring that hereby we form a government of bangladesh so how do you translate this event into architecture into a structure so what we did was to create a a design that could uh, in a abstract way bring you to that moment so this is the place where that swearing in was happening and we built up this structure of brick columns and concrete beams 
they're connected because the people were united and then how you arrive and the path and within this huge mango grove, this is how we decided to uh, commemorate that place. So this is the event and this was the model, uh, this paper model. So some of these columns were left isolated because not everyone was a Bengali in that gathering. You had all these journalists. So the Bengali people, were, this is the stage and you gather, some had roof like a pavilion and everything open. It, it, it is. So this is, this is a rendering of course, uh, which was done much after then that was the original model. But unfortunate for us, sad for us, we won the first prize, but the government decided they won't go for it because it didn't look impressive enough to the head of the state who was a general and he would decide what would be built. So we won the prize, we got the prize money, but unbuilt. So you start with a kind of a unsuccessful attempt, being a winner, because I will go back to that uh, later on also. So this is the kind of uh, environment we're thinking for the monument. So not people, those brick columns, these uh, concrete beams. The first project that I had the opportunity to to get constructed was a small housing project. And this was a river. This is a river which borders with India. And this is a gas distribution company which has this gas pipeline traveling here. So they needed to have this land. They acquired this land and they said that, okay, we also want to use it for a housing project. So. In the late 80s, we had this project, but we decided to depart from uh, a practice of putting up multi-storied apartments or being very, I mean, unlike Muslim Islam who organized it in a way, we took our ideas from the rural and vernacular architecture, which had continued over the ages without being uh, sort of influenced by the formal architecture. So we decided to organize the houses around small courtyards. And whether you had a smaller house or a bigger house, you were sharing the same compound. There was a big pond and then there was a community place. And of course the big boss had to have a bungalow, but he, the big boss, would go and use the same street. And all these people would come to this office was already there. They had built it. So you were sharing everything. It was not that you were somewhere else. So this is how we started generating the idea that uh, we can think about an architecture which can be a shared architecture. But at that time, when we built it, we wanted to use exposed brick, but it was difficult uh, to get good quality brick and the type of, but this apartments, one in the ground and one in the upper level would share a compound so that everybody would interact when you enter, when you leave the face, uh, flats, apartments. So that was important uh, for us and also, how do you distribute, for example, in the ground level, these people would get a, a space uh, here for their use, and the people in the upper level would get a, a terrace here on the, uh, so they could have some open to sky uh, places. But this project is the first project that we had a chance to uh, scale up this uh, idea of vernacular architecture uh, uh, inspiring contemporary production. Uh, I was talking uh, to my young friends here about this conference in 1985 in Dhaka, where they had invited 
uh, architects from South Asia, Doshi, Charles Korea, Raj Rewal from Sri Lanka, we had Jeffrey Bauer, but not only that, we had historians like Kenneth Frampton, like William Curtis, philosophers like Mohammed Arkun, and all this happened in Dhaka because at that time, Mazhar Islam was a member of the jury of Aga Khan Award. The first Aga Khan Award, he was one of the jurors and how the award evolved. So everyone convened in Dhaka to discuss architecture and the theme was the regionalism in architecture. How can architecture have this regional expressions? I mean, it's not that everything has to be the same. So a particular region, maybe in the tropics, like in Bangladesh, could have a distinct expression of architecture. So this is a project that I did for an organization called BRAC. BRAC is, a, is the world's largest NGO, and they were building all these training places so we could get one project. So this is a complex, a dormitory for all the trainees to come and stay for the training. This is the dormitory for trainers, and this is the place where they get the training. And this is a big meeting room. This is the dining room. This is the services, classrooms, library, and offices. So next to a highway, a big piece of land, flat, and our neighbor here was a institute, which was more regimental. The regular blocks placed uh, in a regular orientation. And we wanted to break it. Why we wanted to break it? Because all around were villages with this beautiful, lovely houses made of bamboo, made of mud, thatch, around the courtyard, and we wanted to recreate an environment which would echo that. So this are from 1991-92, but inspiration from the tradition. So this is how it was like once it was built, and very tight budget. When it comes to budget, especially for these projects, how, how much cost you can cut. So you have to make it very basic. So we used brick and concrete for the rooms, but for climate protection and for services, we use this concrete tiles, the micro tiles so that would protect from sun and from rain. And you can see the surrounding landscape, the rice paddy, the village homes. So we didn't want to uh, change it uh, drastically or dramatically, but wanted to make an evol uh, evolution. And this is how the ground plan was like, the courtyards and the structures, low rise structures, access, a big pond, the small pond with the steps leading to the pond. And this is how the environment was once uh, the trees grew. Very modest in scale, very basic in construction, and very tropical. You would allow the air to flow through. You would keep the rain away, but you can enjoy the rain if you're on this terrace. And the flexibility was such that five rooms would share a building and the toilets, and you can be uh, dividing them appropriately because you wouldn't know that how many women and how many men will be the participants. So you can allocate the houses uh, like that. And then followed by another training center in the Southwest. Here also, we take the same idea of arranging around courtyards, the training complex. But here, unlike the BRAC project, 
It was much tighter site, a compact one. And this organization was run by a lady, a very fierce feminist. She was working for the empowerment of women and uh, for economic uh, equality. And, and, she, and when we were working there, we were constantly under what you call a pressure being males that you are the problem. So, and that was another ch challenge we had to take as an architect besides designing a building, but we needed to also tackle that. So we said that we'll make a place for you where you will celebrate the gender equality. I mean, architecture has to be like this. And then we designed this place for her, again, following the traditional and vernacular architectural ideas and then relating with the environment. There was a huge pond in the site. And we said that we want to bring the building to the edge of the water. So water and building should be together. Not you say that building is there, water is there. It's a coexistence, and how do you create that kind of it? And very basic, again, handmade bricks, which is very much present in all uh, Bangladeshis. And then again, concrete tiles, sorry. So some of the images. So this was 90s, and that is the time that I had been very active doing work, a lot of uh, work. This is a house and a workplace from, for a group of archeologists who'd go from France and spend three months in a historic site excavating. They needed a place to stay and work. And then they saw the uh, earlier project and they said that we want you to design this house for us. So this is how it, uh, was put together, two courtyards again. This is the workplace, this is the living quarters, and this is the common space, the dining kitchen and the lounge. And the house was going to be used for three months because uh, during winter, the, you, could, you could dig, you could excavate because otherwise it's monsoon and it's very difficult to uh, do archeological excavation and you'd go and uh, live there for three months. And it was a challenge. And as it was near a historic site, we wanted to keep it low and modest, again, with brick and concrete. And this is how it has been like to enter into the house. And the roof terrace was used. So one could go up. One, I didn't want to put many things except for the water tank. So this is the rampart of this old ancient site where they were carrying the uh, excavation. So how to keep it modest, uh, low scale thing. So this is the plan of the living area, the plan of the working area. And there was a small uh, canal near the site. In 1996, yes, uh, five, six, I had this opportunity of being invited by the Italian Red Cross Society to design a hostel, a dormitory for Buddhist students. Uh, we have uh, a number of religions. We, we are predominantly Muslims in the country, but we have people from the Hindu religion, Buddhist religion, and of course, Christian religion. So these are the prominent religions, but being in a predominant Muslim country, at times, the religious minorities do not get equal opportunities. It is, it is, it is uh, strange. I mean, this is how it is like in South Asia and many other parts. So I get this opportunity to design a dormitory 
for Buddhist students who are from the hills and from the plains, because we have some hills in the Chittagong area, and there are uh, uh, people who follow Buddhism. And how was I going to design a place which could make them feel that they are not in an environment where they're seen as someone not having the best of things. So I wanted to offer an environment where the students who'd stay there would feel that, okay, this is nice. This is a good place for us to stay and uh, uh, go to the university. So it happened in two phases. This was the first phase where I designed a dormitory for 50 students with dining, with library, with the hostel supervisors. And then as the construction was completing, they could get more money and they asked me to do a second building, which was not thought before, but the program is, was a little different. So we had uh, 25 more students, a small guest facility and a facility for monks, the Buddhist monks, because the land was given by the temple. So this was a temple that was existing and the temple head priest wanted the students to have a dormitory because the big Chittagong University was here. These people would not get accommodation in the university and the monk uh, offered them. But in 1991, we had a big cyclone and the houses that they were staying were very uh, basic and the cyclone caused heavy damage and Italian Red Cross Society came forward uh, to offer them support. And I was chosen by a priest, a Zaverian father who saw my earlier works and he said that you designed this for me. So it was interesting, a Christian priest and Buddhist users and a Muslim architect, but I mean, so it, it brought together these three groups to work on a project together. So I would say that this, this is uh, uh, the way we, I should look, we should all look forward to work. I mean, how, how can we create this? I mean, not separations, not that well, I don't work for you. I'm, you don't, the parliament house in Dhaka, you have visited the parliament house. It has one of the best mosques, contemporary mosque. I mean, if you remember this turrets in the entry, this circular elements, and that mosque is part of the parliament, a prayer room designed by Louis Kahn. And I would say that that's the best modern mosque ever designed. And who was Kahn? He was an architect of Jewish faith. So a Jewish architect can give you a fantastic mosque. So why not a Muslim architect who can give you a nice hostel? I mean, I can try it. No, it's amazing that we, we at times create these barriers that you cannot do this, you can do this, you can. So what I design is this. This was the first building that was put together and this is the second building. In between, they wanted to put together a stupa. I mean, a, a, a temple uh, uh, over there. And they didn't have the money because it was going to be a hemisphere, a stupa. So I said, look, let's do a space which can be used by the community by the religious uh, groups. So, so every year or every time a new monk is entering this monkship, so you get your graduation, not a degree or certificate, but you get a robe, a robe, orange colored robe that is given to you and all the head priest, they sit here 
and the monks who are graduating, they sit there, so they come and they receive their uh, graduation certificate or degree that now you are in the order of monks. And in other times, it's a public place. People from the villages, they come, you can have programs, functions. And then the first building has this courtyard and then the new building and the first building, they are combined by this big space, a social, religious, public space, the existing temple. And then there was a water channel. So I bring people all the way to the water. You can sit here, you can celebrate the water. So it's not only about buildings. But what I have to share now that while the building exercises were being done, but simultaneously there's another work that I was involved in is documenting the architectural uh, heritage of Bangladesh, going out, measuring them, because before that, there was no document like that which could tell you how the structures were in plan or in section or in elevation, but we could only do a very basic documentation, do a measured plan, measured drawing, and a principal elevation. Because for our, us, I mean, architects, we, we really need to have an idea of the precedent architecture, how we have come here. I mean, this, this structure is preceded by many other structures where people would convene and discuss. So maybe it was first a tree under the shade of tree. And then when we started building things, so now we have this hall, there will be more halls. So how people built a praying space, a mosque, how people built a monastery and a temple, how people built a temple which would have a spire and a temple which would be so ornately and profusely decorated with terracotta. I mean, no stone, all brick. And then these houses and this big, huge temple. So we, from that group, the group was called Chetona. We decided to do this. And I had this opportunity of directing this, coordinating this, an amazing experience for an architect who's trying to discover his own past, own history. So simultaneously, you are trying to do things. And for that, you are trying to look into the vernacular architecture, which had remained unchanged for ages. And then you're going to find out also the traces of architecture that was from thousands of years or hundreds of years. So this is another thing. And that culminated into an exhibition. So here again, this is me explaining to he's the vice chancellor of the university. This was in the National Museum. And this exhibition in 1997, in December 1997, took place in Dhaka. This was the first architectural exposition of that scale happening in the National Museum. So it was a big event. The reason I'm narrating all this is that one doesn't come to a place just like that. I mean, even coming here in Copenhagen, it needed a lot of preparation. Natalie had to know about me. Mate had to know about me. Pernil had to know about me. So this is how we link. So we wanted to link to places, history, which we were not aware of. So this was important. And I, I, I take you to this journey because I know the school has made us known 
this bamboo school. But how did we come to the bamboo school? We were there in the brick monasteries. We were there in the brick mosque. We were there in the Khan parliament. We were there in Mother Islam's housing and the rural houses. So this was important to put for a country and then a book, which uh, you just had a look. But 97 and 2000, the new millennium, I think at that time in the 90s, we were not that uh, much sure of what was waiting for us in the new millennium because the world was changing fast. From the 80s, when the collapse of Soviet Union and the collapsing of Berlin Wall and the new economic order that was coming into the world, we were so much driven with those recording of the past or inspiring the vernacular architecture, the world was changing. And this new economic order that came in the 90s and then went in a very robust and aggressive manner into the new millennium. I mean, for an architect like me, it was a bit of a lost period. So there were projects, there were commissions, which were not that, I mean, interesting. So. Here's a factory that I had designed. This is for ready-made garments. And you know that today Bangladesh is enjoying a lot of prosperity because of the ready-made garments. Many people are employed and we are uh, supplying uh, to almost all the countries, I mean, who are so, to America, to Europe, and to many places. So. That needed to be done. So one, one entrepreneur came because after I had designed the hostel, he said that, oh, you are a famous architect. I want you to design this factory. But I tell you that I haven't done a factory in that way. So I said, okay, I'll take the uh, opportunity. So this was a simple uh, uh, problem. He wanted a multi-level work uh, space and garments does not require very heavy machineries. You need floors where they can put the sewing. And then one uh, retired government officer comes to me and says that he wants to build a small house in his village, but it should be a bit more uh, robust. So use concrete and brick and then another uh, person. So these small scale projects and other issues kept me away uh, from uh, really fully engrossed. Then comes a small project. A, a school or a center for adolescent girls in the village, in the villages who drop out of school because not many girls can continue studying into higher uh, levels because then they're, one is that they're not uh, allowed by the family and also they have to get involved in the housework. The boys are the privileged people. They want to uh, send the boys to the school and uh, become doctors, become engineers. But girls, you stay uh, at home. You help your mother. You do the household works and all these things. So that, that is there. So there is this organization who wanted to make a center where these girls who have dropped out of school, they can come and get some basic science education. I mean, basic healthcare, basic hygiene. At least they can raise their family in more knowledgeable way. Because uh, when you are uh, fully in a traditional knowledge sphere, you may be doing a lot of things which may not be uh, right, appropriate. And uh, we had a lot of this issues. So I get this. People, and they came to me, said that they have got 10,000 US dollars donated by a couple in Luxembourg or in, uh, yeah, uh, probably in Belgium, who got it as a gift, as a wedding, 50 years wedding anniversary gift. And 
they wanted to give it to them to build a small place for these girls. And these people knew that this man can do these things uh, with little money, but uh, big places, but big meaning. So they came to me and they said, you keep your expenses from here and give us a place. So right there, I mean, trying to keep the cost as little as possible, I made this place for the girls. So there was a big room for the girls to come and there was a library and a window which had glasses to allow the light and these awnings to allow the air and keep the rain out. So just these awnings and this brick wall. And again, to keep the cost low, I would only put the thicker members and the less thicker members alternating so we could save on the brick wall. So the thicker ones carry the load and the thinner ones are for the uh, keeping uh, rain and uh, uh, so very simple, very basic. Then I get another opportunity to do a school in the north and uh, I was very excited. It's a very uh, extreme climate and uh, there was also issue with the size of the land and there were beautiful mango trees here. And I said, I don't want to cut this mango trees. So we put a school, a compact school with a small courtyard uh, in between. Sadly, it was not built. So this is how it might have looked. I mean, if it was built. So climate, because it was a very extreme uh, hot region, and we needed to create uh, a shaded uh, space, the classroom and the corridors, and again with bricks uh, and brick jallies. So that first 10 years was very frustrating of the new millennium. And I decided to take what do you call hiatus or take a break. And I decided to go to one type of landscape which is a kind of an extreme landscape. This is, these are the river islands which emerge and disappear like that. And people go and inhabit them because we are a densely populated country and people are always looking for a piece of land to inhabit, to put it into production. So some of these places which would not be normally habitated people would go and start a settlement over there. So I started going to this kind of places to look for this way, how people would inhabit, how people would settle with this kind of condition and how you build things. So I've been going for almost three years and then at the end, this entire settlement disappeared. It's no longer existing because the river has taken that place. But it taught me a lot and which I could use it for this project. So this project is that school that uh, uh, Natalie <laughs> had been fascinated with and she wanted me to come in. So for coming to the school, I took a little bit of a long route because you, you, I, I'm sure it's, it, it, uh, you might have now understand that how this man who has started with all this and come and end up in this school made of bamboo, which is, I mean, not a uh, reliable material for a, a building like that. I mean, that's the popular uh, notion people would have. And why did I decide? So this is the site plan. So I was telling Natalia and Mette that my client, who also happens to be my aunt, so she once, I mean, told me, I have to take you to this place. I have bought a land. I want to build a small school over there. Uh, so you have to, so she, we, I was taken by a car and we got down from the car. This is a bridge. So we'd come and stand here and she would point out to this place over here. This is where I want to build the school. 
And I looked at the place. There was no land. It was water. And then I said, that, where do you want to build it? Where, where do you put, want to put the school? There, she pointed out. I said, I only see water. But no, no, it will emerge in a couple of weeks time. This is October, and that was October 2011. And that October, when I was standing in the bridge, looking into this place, having this conversation with my aunt, when I, I had no idea that I was going to build a school, but I didn't want to disappoint her, saying that, no, I'm not going to do it. I said, let me study this, let me see, let me come back to you. I did not refuse the commission. And what kind of followed was a, a journey from the learning of those islands where I was going and traveling and the way one can look into the future of habitation where water and land, you are considering it together, not separate. So, I mean, we have always thought that, okay, this is where the land ends, this is where the water begins. And now with the climate thing, you don't know the water is going to stay here. It's going to come here, it's going to come here. And for a country like Bangladesh, we are assuming that if it's a 1.5 degree Celsius, if you breach that two degrees, I think 40%. So we have to start thinking, but at that moment, it was not climate change. At that moment, I had to satisfy my aunt's uh, requirements that she needed to build a school and how, how can I do a school for her? So this is uh, October, 2011. So this is what I experienced a year. Back. So I had time. I didn't have to go back to her with the immediate design because she also needed to put together her finance. And I said, I needed time to study. So I'd go back and observe the place over the years. So I just selected one or two. So the next year, again, in September, it was like this. So in December, 2014, we started working on the construction. So I had good amount of time, but not that it was a regular commission. I had to find time from my work to uh, devote time for this because this was not going to pay me that much, but this was an opportunity to do a work like this. So we started working, but before I uh, go into the project design, I want to talk a little bit about the flood plains, because that particular area which my aunt had selected to build a school was, I mean, in geographical terms, would be called a floodplain. So what is a floodplain? I'm sure you know. So every monsoon, water will come from the Himalayas, water will come from the sky, and they will flood areas which are depressions. So there are high areas and low lands. So this is Bangladesh's different type of floods we have. We have, this is a flood that happens near the bay. This is the flood which brings uh, wa the, wa the water from Brahmaputra comes and flows and floods this area. This is from the Ganges. So even floods, we have many different type of floods happening at different type of the year. And so this is the flood map. And this area in the gray shade is the flood plains. So all the physical development we have been having was very much driven by a very uh, straightforward thinking like this that you need a road, you just build a road like this. You want to connect these two places, but not without, I mean, not considering how the water behaves. And 
no matter, I mean, this is where engineering and architecture need to combine. I mean, architecture not, so not only about building, it is about settlement, how we are going to inhabit. So our floods are more aggravated because of this kind of decisions to build infrastructure, which does not take into consideration of this coming of water and the going of water. So that is important. So these maps were available, but they were used by water engineers, not architects. Where to put the embankment, where to put the uh, poldering of the areas, but not that you can live with the water. The water will come, water will go. So why not create an infrastructure? Why not create a settlement that keeps that in your uh, uh, consideration? And even the floodplains have categories. So this plane has a characteristic, this plane has a characteristic. So the geographers, have done a beautiful job of informing us about the topography, about the surface or what is beneath the surface. But at times we miss those things out because we are so focused on the, the building only. But a building does not exist by own because the building interacts with everything, water, air, Anyway, but I, I, I just wanted to share this because that school uh, allowed me to take note of these conditions. In the dry season, this is how the water is like in the country. And look in the wet season. This is normal. This is typical. So this is how our ancestors have been living the water comes and water goes. That's a seasonal thing. But we modern people, we said that no, we want to be like uh, a dry person all along the year. We want to be always on the dry land, always on the dry ground, but cohabiting with this condition. So that was something. And then we have also developed this practice how to erase the floodplain. So I don't know whether you had seen this, but we have got these dredgers. They dredge sand from the riverbeds and we've got these barges that fill these barges. And then we've got these pumps would pump because you need land and you erase the natural topography. You erase the floodplains so that was another danger that was uh, taking happening, that you are changing the topography, you're changing the nature. So my options were these three, for these three. This is the site during the dry season, this is the site during the wet season. So I could raise it, put the school on top of this mound. When the water comes, it will be like this like an island. I could put it on stilts, so the school will be free of the flood, assuming that the flood comes to up to that level. So if there's more water, it will go. And then this option, which we actually eventually did, was a structure that will float when the water comes, when the water goes away, it settles back on the ground. Well, it's nothing, uh, I mean, new. I mean, people, I mean, we have amphibious things. We, we, we know about these things which can operate in both conditions. But this was not a moving thing. This was stationary. And it had to be uh, uh, well thought out, calibrated and all this uh, stuff. But I did not employ this high technology. I mean, I didn't have that access of... Uh, doing the simulations, the models uh, for uh, doing that. So relying on a very basic knowledge, employing some engineers to give me the calculations of buoyancy and the uh, uh, way we'd like to 
can put together the structure. So we did it. So this is a, a, a diagram that shows that the assembly, because we needed to also do it in a way that it was a modular construction. So all these work people, they knew that if they can make one module, they can repeat it and construct. So that was important uh, also for uh, us. And then we had to do a 3D visualization to communicate to the client that how it will be like in the dry condition, in the wet. I mean, it was a, uh, what you call a still image. It was not a moving image, not a simulation of the water coming and the behavior of the structure. But that, I mean, that, that's what I had at the time. And client was very convinced. She said that I want to build it. Like, I don't know because it's, it's, it, I have not done one before. This is going to be the first one, but I don't care. And I said that, look, uh, do we need all this? Let's build only one, let's test it out. But you go for the whole thing. And she was so courageous. She's 84 now. And at that time she was, uh, how many years? Uh, in 2011, so 10 years, she was 74, 75. And, she decided to go ahead with it, with this experiment. And then we worked out like architect, precise plans, but bamboo, can you draw bamboo like this, a straight line? Because it's not, unless you make it in the lab, a straight bamboo, but bamboo would grow its own way. So we can, but I asked my assistants, draw me a bamboo, which is uh, not straight, but somehow the softwares they were using because we were using computers, they could not draw that because back in our days when we draw by hand. So if we needed to draw something which was not a precise thing, we do freehand drawings. I mean, okay, you have drawn it and then you have this rotary pen going over the lines, which will create a little wavy uh, line. So that's what show that uh, it's a, a freehand uh, drawing. Anyway, so the plan, and then the section, we understand sections, and then the construction. So you can see the precise drawings meeting a very unprecise way of building. And all these workers were, they, they were mostly carpenters, because bamboo, uh, we had to make scale models, which was in the site, and we would uh, have architects. go in. So it was a long process. And uh, I, I'm sure that many of you know about this, the details, so I'm not going to go into the detail. So it took us almost a year to complete this project and part of the construction was carried out in the water, on the water, because monsoon had come. So we were to race to make these platforms, the uh, rafts uh, before the water comes. So, and when the water came, it floated and we continued to work. And this is a map that shows what happens in different conditions because the water does not come all together. They come gradually. They come slowly, but they recede very rapidly when the water is uh, going to the bay. So that, that is the dynamic condition whenever uh, we want to uh, simulate. I think that is something which we uh, as architects, because well, I can say that it's not very simple what I have learned. It's much complex, but the idea there. And then we, it was all made by hand. And I was telling Phil that we had this battery operated drill machines and the drill machines had to be charged to take, uh, when they were taken to a market where they would put it on charge and maybe after putting two holes in the bamboo, it needed to be taken back. So I said, I want the old way because we had this traditional non-motorized drill machines. So let's do it. And this carpenter 
was in charge of the entire construction. And I mean, he couldn't believe that. He, he, he was a carpenter. He knew the way of working with wood. And we were making him because he was the carpenter working for the client. And the client wanted him to be in charge of the construction. But I said, no, you do it. You find out. And he maintained it well. But sadly, in 2020, when COVID came, uh, he had to leave the place because he was there all the time looking after the structure, maintaining it. Uh, it was completed in uh, spring of 2016. And in 2020 spring, when COVID was full, so one is that he had to leave. And that year, it was unprecedented flood. That flood was not considered and that caused the damage. The school uh, could not survive that flood. And this man passed away in this January, this carpenter. So here was a team. If uh, I was talking about the dormitory where we had uh, a Muslim architect and a Buddhist client and a Christian um, uh, funding uh, source. Here we had this carpenter, this architect who was past his prime if you consider the age taking this and the client who was also on an adventure. And sadly, the passing away of this carpenter is uh, a big setback because we are planning to rebuild this uh, project. And this is how it appeared in the spring of 2019, when this photographer from the Aga Khan people, they came to picture this. And when I looked at this photo, I said that, look, I never thought that it was going to blend with the nature. I don't think that we have done something. It's, it seemed like that the nature had done the, uh, the work. And there was a huge brick kiln, the making brick. And so it was interesting that there was a structure which we were thinking would be something appropriate here. And there was a huge brick field next to it, which of course uh, is a big source of pollution, uh, 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 all these things. The brick field has moved away from here, but again, this area has been altered. They have filled up this land. So when we rebuild it, there'll be new challenges. And the same, Monsoon in 2019, monsoon, the Aga Khan people said that we want to check whether it floats. So we had to re photograph that before they would make the announcement. So that was uh, the photograph from 2019. And this is how it blends with the landscape in the monsoon. And then the students of architecture would go and make regular visits. So we had a school for kindergarten children and we had a school for architecture students. So all this university would send their students and come. So these are from a uh, uh, student and they were taken by their teacher sitting there to, to study, to learn about this structure. Well, the journey uh, continues. So there is a, a apartment building that we are working on at the moment. But here also we have a shared situation. The brothers and sisters will be living together. So we use the terrace. And then here we have some bamboo screens again. These bamboo screens are not only for shading, but also for privacy. What privacy? Because we have such a dense urban situation. So in the evening, when you light up your apartment, you have to close the curtains. You have to draw the curtains because your neighbors will see you from outside, from their houses. But when you close the curtains, it stops the air to flow. So I said that why not do a screen that will allow us to keep the windows open and also keep our privacy 
and not inside the room, but outside the room, which can bring air and light during the day. And during the day, you can keep the shutters open because you have more intense light outside, so you cannot see anything inside. But during the evening, these shutters will be closed and the building will be like a lantern. So that's, this is a factory. Again, I've, I've got a factory. I've got two factories, in fact. But this is in a site which is sloping and they wanted to fill this, make it a uh, level situation. I said, no, no, we, we, we keep it like this. We want the water to flow its natural path. It will cost you a little bit more, but it will do good for the environment. And we have put this shading. These are bamboo on steel structure. So it will let the light come in and then it will also create a very comfortable cooling shade. So that is a bamboo shading. And then we have this factory, which is also under construction. This client had a big pond here. And he said that I want to fill it up and I want to put a factory over there. No way, no filling up. Let's do something which can keep the pond, which will retain the water, and let's also have the factory. So let's, let's have a win-win situation, as you say. The environment wins and your economic activity wins. So this is being, uh, uh, under, this is also under construction. But again, I bring this bamboo screening because on this side, he has some garden and some uh, his uh, house. And he said that I really don't want to be seen from the interior of the factory. But I said that, look, the workers also need light and they need to look out. So why not create something uh, for them also? So what we did, again, a screen, and these are the planter boxes. So when you're working, you're in the sewing machine, but if you want to look out, you have this lovely, hopefully lovely screen and all these green plants. So that, that also, helps with the productivity. And when these workers are working in a condition which allows natural light, natural air, and some greenery. So this is, this is also under construction. This is a project I was doing for uh, a client who wanted to do a, a social and a, a leisure place for the garments workers. And he wanted to make the small cinema halls because after work, they could come here and enjoy movies. And then there would be shops, restaurants, and some community functions like a small clinic for health checkup. But this project got abandoned, but I was very excited because I wanted to work for these workers. Uh, and now we are uh, uh, also considering some extension to the school, which will rebuild a workshop and accommodation for uh, workers. So this is again in bamboo. So uh, this is a workshop because at that time the client was thinking of having a workshop where the carpenter could teach apprentices uh, uh, and with bamboo, I mean, no windows, no, uh, uh, so you, to allow the air to flow through bamboo roof. But it was a hybrid construction. Why hybrid? We had concrete posts going up to this level because we also found out that unless we develop uh, that uh, measure to make bamboos more uh, durable, and especially to this condition of changing uh, water because it's submerged for all this time in water and then it's dry, so it has some effect. I mean, though we treated uh, the uh, uh, bamboos, but it was an issue. So this is a very popular thing in all our rural areas, concrete post. You can find it in almost all the villages because nobody's building with bamboo anymore. So this... Uh, 
concrete posts and the entire house and then this corrugated iron sheets. So it's 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 a little bit of a disaster because corrugated iron sheet is not good for the climate over there. In the summer, it becomes extremely hot. It's like you're in an oven. And in the winter, it is very cold. You're in a freezer because it's the metal, it uh, absorbs uh, heat and uh, it gives away uh, very quickly. So we decided that we will use concrete post up to a level where we could combine it with the bamboo post. So this is the work in progress. And this was the accommodation uh, for the staff who would stay there. And hopefully we can take it up again this year. And this is a small market for the Rohingya uh, refugees, because you know this all these refugees who had come here. And the refugee camps are on these small hills. And these are the plains. So this market, uh, the idea was that the villages, what you call, uh, call host community, they would come with their products and the refugees would come because they get these cards from the World Food Program to buy their things. So they would come with their cards. They would, so it's a uh, interaction between the host community and the guests, the refugees. But sadly, it was not built. But this was something during the COVID period. So we had to work in a very difficult uh, situation. I had to rely on these images that they were sending me. So again, and the United Nations organizations had a strict uh, uh, order that nothing can be built with permanent materials because these people are here on a temporary basis. So it is a temporary shelter and temporary structure. So bamboo was something that could be used. So again, uh, uh, the market needed uh, kind of a access uh, control and ex entry and exits because they would come with their cards and uh, they would be recorded. So we created a, a design uh, which had two small courtyards and all the vendors who would come with the things would go like this. So you enter, the girls enter from this side and the boys, men enter from here and they get their cards punched. Uh, so they get, get this credit and there's no transaction, which I observed here in Denmark, now in Copenhagen, that you are a cashless society. And I'm glad that I was carrying a credit card. Otherwise I would have to, uh, and nobody takes uh, cash, no, not even, uh, even no, nobody takes Euro because I was not having any kroner. So this is something which was going to be there. The refugees would be carrying the card. And, but sadly the project got abandoned. And then I was talking about this film I just worked on as a production designer where this film director, he wanted to have a, a place which would be from the 17th century. I mean, how to create that. So I said that, look, I cannot tell you how exactly it was like, but I can imagine a past where people built with bamboo, people built with thatch and they were very elegant designs. They were very elegant places. It was not that some, uh, so I designed few houses. So this was a house uh, for a businessman in that movie. This is a house for a prince. And this is a pavilion on water, a pleasure pavilion. I mean, the rulers would have something like that. So this was the house for the prince. So I use mud floors, bamboo posts, and thatch roofs. And we also had a two-story structure and the courtyard. So this place was already there with trees and everything. So I had to design this place. And this was the house for the businessman, again, uh, with thatch and bamboo and mud. And these people are so happy uh, of making the movie. And, uh, and then the pavilion. 
this is amazing. So uh, uh, you have this, this is a pleasure pavilions, the uh, well they would have in the water. So they are away, uh, uh, you need a boat to come here. So, and I said, that, okay, let's do it. And then the rebuilding. So this is uh, where we are now. We've made some changes, some improvement, but it's work in progress. Hopefully, uh, we can do it the way. And this is the group uh, that were building the movie set. Uh, so this is the director, and this is the architect and his crew. So this woman who do the floor with their hands, the mud floors, and I can tell you that no polishing machine would give the finish that this hands, I have images, uh, photographs that shows that how a hand can work on the floor and make it so beautiful. And the pattern that the hand leaves on the floor because they do it like this, like the machine you play in the floor and polish the floor. And these men are all craftspeople. They do, they're amazing with bamboo. And I spotted this man who's in the middle. He makes this lovely fish traps with bamboo uh, thing and amazing shapes, hyperbolic, parabolic shapes. And they use it during the monsoon period. The fishes, they uh, think that they're going against the current and they end up in the stuff, but lovely structures. So this man was made in charge of the entire crew. And I had a fantastic, it, it was from January to June that this entire operation and it gave me, gave me a lot of experience. And then this photo is sums up everything. This is the women football team from Bangladesh, which became the champions of South Asian football. And there was a time that nobody would believe that women would play football in Bangladesh. I mean, uh, there were a lot of issues. Uh, as, as like that adolescent center that women, uh, girls wouldn't be. And these girls made us proud. They became the champion within South Asia. So you can see if you are really trying, focused, if you have, uh, I think you can, you can reap the benefits, the successes. And these girls, explain that to us. And in architecture, I would say that we know a lot. We can do things which can be firm, which can last long. But then again, we don't know that one day this everlasting things can be of no use because when we talk about climate change, there are issues over there. Even in inequality, we have seen places that were stormed by people, whether it's a palace or whether it's a big hall. So we must prepare ourselves for a society, for a future where we can take care of our environment, of the things we do together. Not that I take care, you take care. So that's why I said that if we built in the idea of equity in architecture, we would solve a lot of important problems. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with me. I didn't keep track of the time. So I, I took the liberty of one and a half hour or two. Hour. I can, I, now I can rest. Phil, Phil will do the talking. No. So, so maybe about an hour. No, 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 no,
<laughs> well, I mean, so um, firstly, thank you so much for such for for, for such an enriching uh, presentation, Saif, um, and also to kind of contextualise your work through through your own career history. I think has been uh, really wonderful for us to see. Um, you know, you, you're you're talking about the kind of um, notion of um, architectures and permanence and change, and it's it's wonderful to see how your practice has changed. Um, although I, I would argue that there, there are certain threads in your practice that kind of remain as permanent fixtures. Um, your, your architecture seems beautifully poised between projecting a, a certain pride and yet also having a humility. Um, I think it also points towards different attitudes of architecture that really question where a lot of contemporary architecture focuses. Um, and this is to do with kind of questions around uh, perhaps the kind of capitalist times we live in, where things like more consumption is privileged over better consumption, or privatization is privileged over community building, or uh, man-made capital is privileged over natural capital. Um, and it seems that your, your architecture offers perhaps really interesting models uh, towards how we might um, question the kind of um, societal value that privileges growth in an economic sense rather than growth in, in other, other ways of measuring it, such as community building, social cohesion, uh, these kind of things. So it, it, you know, your, your practice really, I think, um, speaks towards um, embodying a different kind of worldview. Um, it's, it it seems. I, I mean, I'm just making a comment here in sure. terms of in terms of what I've been reading from from your work. Uh, your, your work is also, you know, incredibly accommodating. Um, and it, as as we move towards, I mean, particularly the Acadia project, um, it seems that the kind of um, technologies that you're working with there, I think, are really fascinating because they they kind of buck away from the technologies that are generally associated with contemporary architecture and it seems that there's a a move perhaps towards trying to encourage us as architects in our education to appreciate what what perhaps we could call arcadian technologies um, so, you know, Acadia being this kind of notion about the pastoral, having a, 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 a harmony with our surroundings, Acadian technologies might do that also. Um, now, if we think about, I, I could point to perhaps the purest form of Acadian technology that I'm aware of, which actually lies 200 kilometers northeast in Meghalaya over the other side into, into India now, where uh, communities there use living trees to build infrastructure through these amazing root bridges. Um, perhaps your Acadian technologies are um, slightly more um, corrupted in the, in the positive sense. Uh, they're more restorative and they also appropriate residues of industry so this idea that you can kind of combine the oil barrel together with the um, the growth of bamboo, I think is 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 a, a really fascinating world of technologies um, and points towards an incredible inventiveness. Um, I suppose if there's one question that starts to emerge from this is um, how is it that we can begin to educate the patrons that we are reliant upon towards aspiring towards Acadian technologies rather than the technologies that are causing so much damage in the construction of our built environment. Yeah. Uh, first I have to 
Thank Phil for that beautiful summing up. I mean, that's the advantage he has over me because the language is his native language. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I, I cannot communicate uh, maybe not in uh, such a beautiful way that the way he summed up the presentation. And uh, I think uh, at the end, uh, it's not about the architect. I mean, it's, but it's about all the people who experience, who use, who appreciate, or who criticize, it's about them. The architect, I mean, to me, an architect can enjoy it from distance, can read from a distance, doesn't have to be right in the middle in the stage. So uh, I think Phil has done a wonderful job. If you remember, you have to write it and you have to send it to me. Because I can, no, no, because that's a beautiful way of putting together. But how, how do we carry these ideas forward? How does our experiments, I mean, I was, I was going to say that we don't reach at a point or uh, arrive at a destination, I mean, just like that. We do a journey. So for me, it's been a journey. Even Arcadia, so uh, I mean, 2011 and now 22, and it is continuing. And I'm happy that we got the recognition, the award, but I'm more happy that my aunt got her investment back <laughs> because as the flood has damaged the school, and she had invested and when she put the money, she didn't know that she was going to win an award, which was going to give some money. And I feel good that the project has fulfilled uh, my desire of having a structure that uh, can uh, talk about the current issues and all these things. And my aunt, she's a retired school teacher. She took a chance. She sided with her nephew who wanted to carry out this crazy experiment. But I don't think that there are many of my aunts around to patronize. So I'm not saying that can be a feasible approach uh, to creating patrons. But she has taken a feasible approach. Natalie, you have taken a feasible approach. Mete has taken a feasible approach. How? I mean, I'm, I'm, I have to tell that the way she has been leading a campaign for this sustainable development goals. I mean, okay, we have so many goals to fulfill, but why this? So if one goes through the 17 goals, there's a roadmap and uh, for a future that you were talking about. Uh, so that's one. And the approach that you have taken, you are showing that things which are seen as not much important, I mean, they're out there in abundance or in the forest, in the nature, but we don't see them as something for the future which can create an environment which is not going to cause so much destruction, which is not going to put us in a situation. So the lab that you showed me today, the work that you gave me around and all this thing, it gives me hope that what I might have done out of spontaneity, spontaneity and a spirit of doing something, you are doing it in a more scientific way. And we have to look for ways how this can be combined and how this can be taken to the next level. So when we don't have to wait for someone to come, people would be coming to us that 
let's do it like this. So it is up to us. It is up to Natalie, it is up to Mete, it is up to you, it is up to me, how we take it to this society. And that's where we have to work. I mean, today we were, I guess, mostly architects. We are talking to each other because it's important because it's not about one architect, two architect or four architects. It has to be a larger mobilization and doesn't have to do the same thing, but carry the same uh, objectives, uh, follow the same, that we want to create a sustainable world, a world of where there won't be such uh, inequality and world that faces climate change. So we, we, we need to do from all possible location, from Brazil, from Ghana, from Vietnam to Bangladesh, here in Denmark. So we have to combine it. And this has to become, and I'm sure patrons will just uh, follow. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm talking about a lot of optimism, a lot of, uh, because I think if you don't dream, you don't get the reality. I mean, uh, what are realities? Because we have dreamt of a situation. Is that okay? Yeah, as an no, answer? That's, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't, I don't know if there's, does, we, we conclude here. Okay. S Super, thank you, you very much, sure everyone, for coming. And uh, thank you again so much, uh, Saif, for sharing your work.